organizations grow like that organically from people just uh, talking and sharing ideas. We have had some meetings uh, with the members that have been so interesting. And, and for me, you know, who, who is outside the world of, of research or, or academics, uh, it is, it is, it is fascinating. I was very early in my career a high school teacher. <laughs> so, so for me, it's it, it is, so, and, and I try to teach uh, at every IMTC something about what I know and my experience in remittances. This is our first IRM one. We will have more in the future. We have invited also IRM to IMTC World uh, 2020, which is will be a virtual event in November 16 to 19. So IRM will have two sessions during the event and then also will be will be very interesting as we grow these organizations. Uh, please just go iorem.org, I-O-R-E-M.org. Just go online, you can, uh, there's a form there, you can become a member. Right now it's just a pretty open membership, it's just you're like, hey, I want to participate with you, I want to help you, and, and that's, that's just fine. So essentially we've looked at four countries we looked at two of the large one of uh, two of the largest corridors in the world uh, US and Mexico and Saudi Arabia and India looking at them as case studies so we did sort of a in-depth case study analysis using qualitative as well as quantitative data we looked at some of the uh, key issues impacting remittances in these two regions which uh, I'm sure all of you are aware are among the most influential and most important regions and uh, having the experience living, working, and also sending money to these regions. I've had the privilege of living in UAE for about two years. I've, I've, I was raised in India, so I have, uh, I'd like to believe a fairly good understanding of the Indian uh, system, the economy and uh, society, as well as now being in the US for about 12 years now. I think uh, personally, I've, I've experienced these issues as well, as uh, even as a scholar. So we felt uh, this could be an interesting uh, book. And just as a background, uh, Daisha and myself, we have written a few papers together. Uh, we, we go back many years uh, to an organization called Parnoa, uh, which is a collaborative of uh, scholars studying civil society issues. Uh, and it's, it's a truly global organization again. So uh, what the book really covers is, a, I mean, first off, it covers a synthesis of the literature in the field. Uh, again, we, it's not, we, we want to be careful what we claim. It's not a synthesis of all the literature, but literature which speaks to issues of development, community building, and policy. So we've sort of looked at these three uh, broad areas. And as I pointed out earlier, we are trying to look at uh, these two pairs of countries, four countries, but two pairs, because we believe these are illustrative of some of the larger phenomena that are uh, ongoing in the space of not just remittances, but also international development and uh, philanthropy. And one of the arguments we make uh, in our previous work, as well as even in the book, is that philanthropy and remittances should be seen together. They should be seen as uh, a manifestation of similar phenomenon. And I think our uh, real contribution, if, if there is one, is uh, to theory building. I think we have, we have tried to argue from a theoretical standpoint using data that we need to look at remittances in a slightly different way than the discourses that we used to. The gap is ever present between that people's voice, the direct impacts, those externalities, positive, negative, and even neutral, but externalities nonetheless, from the vantage point of the recipient, um, the sender, the remitter. What are their gains and their losses, um, the troubles and the circumstances? In many countries, there are specific directives in collecting this incoming data, or at least a sampling of the incoming monies. And even a few, let me emphasize the word few here, <clears throat> track the monetary funds down to the municipal level at times. But those numbers are still numbers and they impact people. So one of the large contributions that our research has added, uh, has added are narratives, those first person dialogues. Um, the dialogues of what is happening to them and how it's happening to them. So now keep in mind, my co-author um, and I are definitely writing this book from the U.S. perspective and from an academic perspective, but we still wanted to kind of capture or start to capture that, um, that qualitative aspect and then include those findings and make connections or attempt to make connections to reason. 
um, what is going on, what is happening. We find that remittances are part of development. Not only do they aid in community development, but that they are motivators to continue cultural traditions. Let's pause. I am sure you are asking yourself, did I just hear her correctly? Um, I just said that remittances um, are motivators to keep cultural tradition. And you did, you heard me absolutely correct. Our research findings assert that remittances are direct motivators and in some instances help preserve tradition, preserve culture and continue on with those roots. Uh, so I will speak briefly about my book. It's called Outsourcing Welfare. Uh, how the money immigrants in home contributes to stability in developing countries. Um, I'll just actually send out, there's a link uh, to the Amazon page for the book in case you're interested in uh, checking it out or purchasing it. And then also I'll send out a link uh, to my website where you can learn a little bit about uh, the work that I've done over the years on uh, migration issues. So I uh, started this project I mean, going back into the early 2000s, it really when I was a waiter in Chicago in my early 20s, I mean, I started working with uh, cooks and busboys in the kitchen of a Chicago restaurant and was hearing stories about remittances every day with these folks that I worked with. And what I tended to hear was that people were sending money back to pay for their, um, their uh, family members' health care, for their family members' education, uh, so that their family members could buy food. They were sending money back in the wake of economic shocks. Uh, their farms had gone, up, gone under back in Mexico or in Central America, and they needed some sort of in income supplement. So I later went to the University of Texas at Austin for my PhD and did uh, survey research in Mexico where I collected data on remittances, how they're used, why people send them, and how it affects the attitudes and perceptions of people that receive them. And uh, so that project was the foundation of my book, Outsourcing Welfare, which was uh, published by Oxford University Press in 2018. And the central argument of the book is that to some degree, international migrants have replaced national governments. So if you're working in the remittance industry, you are part of a global system in which individuals are sending welfare or guaranteeing the welfare of their family members, oftentimes in places where governments aren't doing so. And I think it's a really impressive uh, practice that's occurred here where individuals risk their, uh, their lives, they sacrifice and separate themselves from their family in order to pick up the slack in situations where governments themselves aren't doing all they can do to guarantee a basic standard of living for their people.